the third century BC, Hannibal the Carthaginian attempts the impossible, crossing the Alps with his mercenary army, elephants and all. His target a nemesis, the Roman Republic. Driven by honor and glory, obsessed by a sense of duty to his homeland and his father, Hannibal's deeply personal struggle will transform the Western world. An inspirational leader and genius on the battlefield, Hannibal intends to stop the Roman Republic from taking over the Mediterranean. This is the story of Hannibal versus Rome. minutes before the battle of Hannibal's lifetime. No one has ever seen or will ever see again such a huge Roman army. Hannibal the Carthaginian knows they've come to drive him from the Roman Republic. The odds seem overwhelming, but he's confident. This will be Hannibal's defining moment, the culmination of his lifelong hatred of Rome. Trained to command since the age of nine, he's unlike any other general. He was a jet plane, he was a nuclear bomb, he's a radical new technology. inspired his men, he controlled them carefully, he led them. He was a military genius. For thousands of years, generals will describe this as the perfect battle, Hannibal's masterpiece. He is massively outnumbered, but using brilliant tactics, he virtually annihilates the entire Roman army. Against any normal foe, total victory would soon be his. Rome would fall. Hannibal was an avenger. Hannibal was a destroyer. Hannibal made Rome tremble. The Romans are different. This war is far from over. It will become a fight to the death between two rival civilizations, Rome and Hannibal's North African homeland, Carthage, where his struggle began. Hannibal is nine years old. Carthage surrenders in its first brutal war with Rome. Young Hannibal watches as a Carthage in panic crucifies its failed commanders. One day, it will be his duty to fight for Carthage. Hannibal is the eldest son of the head of the Barca family. The Barkas are all military men. The Barkas are uniquely important and uniquely uncomfortable in Carthaginian society. They are military geniuses in a society that's not a military society. They are the military in a trading and mercantile society, which puts them to some extent at odds with their leadership, but also, I think, gives them a certain allure, a certain appeal. 
Now the head of the clan, Hannibal's father, returns from the war. Hamilcar Barca is Carthage's greatest general, a dedicated defender of the Carthaginian way of life. Before the first war with the Romans, Carthage had been a prosperous and ancient seafaring civilization. Thriving on trade, it dominated the Western Mediterranean. Then, Rome began its relentless military expansion. First, the Romans conquered mainland Italy. Then they crept nearer and nearer Carthage on the North African coast. Thirteen years before Hannibal was born, Rome invaded a Carthaginian province in Sicily. It was Hannibal's father who took the fight back to the Romans. Hamilcar watched thousands die, but never lost a battle. For over a decade, he kept the Romans at bay. Then the merchants of Carthage surrendered. Hamilcar was astounded. Now, as far as he was concerned, the government at Carthage gave in when they hadn't really lost the war. So he's bitter because he feels betrayed at home, but also he's got that animosity against the Romans because he has spent a large chunk of his life fighting them. Better than anyone, Hamilcar knows the danger of having the hated Romans right on his doorstep. Hamilcar, unlike many in the Carthaginian Senate, understands that Rome will expand and take over the entire Mediterranean. He knows that the cost of that will be the life of Carthage, and he is determined to do what he can to stop it. Hamilcar plans to build a new army to take on Rome. His son Hannibal's war is about to begin. Hamilcar sacrifices to the gods to bless his new mission. Hamilcar will leave Africa to raise his army in Spain, far from Rome's prying eyes. He will take Hannibal with him. He's growing older. Uh, life expectancy was short. He is fighting, which is dangerous. He needs a successor. He needs to pass this mantle to his firstborn son, Hannibal. Hamilcar asks his son, Hannibal, to swear a solemn oath of lifelong enmity to Rome. With this simple oath, Hamilcar inducts Hannibal into the family business, killing Romans. The oath of enmity towards Rome resonated in his mind and in his soul. It became what defined him. At just nine years of age, his future is set. His whole life will be devoted to war with Rome. The bark is set out for Spain with Hamilcar's African mercenaries. Here, Hamilcar builds the city of New Carthage and forges a new empire. This will be Hannibal's military training ground. He watches as his father uses Spain's riches to create an army. One day, it will be his. Rome, 
agents report the growing strength of the Barca family in Spain. Something must be done soon to rein in their activities. One powerful and ambitious Roman family will lead the fight and become the Barca clan's nemesis, the Scipios. There isn't room for two great empires in the Mediterranean. But in a certain sense, the war between Rome and Carthage boils down to a war between two families, uh, the Barcas versus the Scipios. In Spain, the Barcas prepare for the inevitable conflict with Rome. Together, they create a fast-moving, sophisticated army years ahead of its time. The Barcas stand for intelligence and warfare. They are the opposite of brutes. The Barcas always stand for unconventional tactics, for very ambitious tactics. Uh, they are the thinking man's generals. For Hannibal, war becomes a way of life. And he learns how to use Carthage's most powerful and exotic weapon, the battle elephant. Shipped from Central Africa and India, they were part of Carthaginian warfare for centuries. Trained to thunder through enemy lines, they terrified enemy cavalry. But these exotic weapons could be difficult to control and dangerous for both sides. Elephants have their problems. You had to train them very, very hard and over a long period if they were going to be effective. Because obviously, naturally, elephants don't plunge into the middle of a battle with noise, with missiles coming at them, with all these strange colors and sights and everything whirling around. So elephants can get frightened. And if an elephant gets frightened and panics, it'll quite possibly stampede back at your own army. Despite the risks, for the Barkas, elephants are a weapon of terror and a proud symbol of the might of Carthage. The elephant epitomizes almost unimaginable strength, power, antiquity. In the Carthaginian mind, the elephant is an extraordinarily potent symbol of what makes us, Carthage, special. Hamilcar is grooming Hannibal to right the wrongs of the first war with Rome. But the Spanish training ground is a dangerous place. Before Hamilcar Barca can lead his army into battle against Rome, he's killed in a skirmish with rebel Spaniards. Now, it is left to Hannibal to fulfill his father's dream. The death of his father was a trauma so profound that he allows it to take him over and he becomes obsessed with succeeding in his father's end, which is inevitably the destruction of Rome as a means to the salvation of Carthage. In the coming years, Hannibal dedicates himself to his father's quest. When he comes of age, he takes over the Barca war machine with the determination of one day leading it to Rome. Hannibal is a natural warrior and commander. Loved by his troops, he's intent on vengeance and glory. 
we might imagine that he thinks of himself not only beginning a military campaign, but also a personal epic. This is not just his chance to win battles, it's his chance to win immortality, undying glory as one of the greatest generals and conquerors of all time. After years of training and fighting the rebel Spaniards, Hannibal has an army of 46,000 mercenaries ready to take on Rome. It's all very well fighting against these Spanish tribes, defeating some people with a name that no one can pronounce in a town that no one's ever heard of. Rome is the great rival, and Hannibal is going to strike at the heart of the Roman Republic and its power. This means in the first place that he's determined to fight the war in Italy. When the Romans lose a battle, it won't occur off the coast of Sicily, it will occur on their doorstep. Scipio and the Senate grow increasingly alarmed by reports of the army being mustered in Spain by Hannibal. They decide to demonstrate the power of Rome by forming an alliance with a Spanish city in Hannibal's territory, the city of Saguntum. What the Romans are saying to the Carthaginians is, heads I win, tails you lose. If we want to treat the Saguntines as allies, uh, we will. And if we don't want to, then we won't. Uh, but we're the ones who set the rules, and you have to dance to our tune. Now, if you're Hannibal, and you see this, you see that the Romans are interfering in your sphere, that the Romans are playing a head game with you. He cannot let the Romans have their way with Saguntum. Rome has provoked the wrong man at the wrong time. Hannibal orders his army to surround Saguntum. Stunned by Hannibal's nerve, the Romans send an envoy to Spain, giving him a last chance to back down. He probably wasn't that surprised when this Roman embassy turned up, though he may well have been annoyed by the arrogance of the Romans. Hannibal may have been trying it on. He may have wanted to see just how far can I go? How much can I show the Romans, look, we are strong now, I have a big army, I'm not afraid of you anymore, I can fight you if I want to, so don't try and push me around in Spain. Spain is not yours, Spain is dominated by Carthage, and we can do what we like here. Hannibal refuses to back down in the face of Roman intimidation. His father Hamilcar couldn't win his war with Rome. But now, Hannibal is confident. His time has come. Yure! Yure! Unlike his father, he has the advantage of being ready this time. He's got an army. He's got a very powerful base in Spain, and this time he feels able to stand up to the Romans. If there was ever a time for a rematch, that time is now. Hannibal attacks the Spanish city of Saguntum. killing aren't Romans, but it doesn't matter. Hannibal has started his war with Rome. I think it was always his intention to sack Saguntum. Rome could not tolerate and would not tolerate that sort of insult to its sovereignty, to its power, to its status. Hannibal had burned his boats. Saguntum is the beginning of the war with Rome.
victory at Saguntum effectively seals Hannibal's fate, because it does mean that a war is going to happen. But he must have realized that this was a major enterprise that would take several years of his life and require huge effort, huge resources. The odds are that since he's been preparing for this, that he was actually quite excited about the prospect. Hannibal will attempt what his father only dreamed of, a spectacular invasion, bringing chaos and humiliation to Rome. Hannibal is a man of vision. This is his moment. The road is open, and now is the chance for him to begin the Great Crusade. Destroying the city of Saguntum was the first step on Hannibal's road to Rome. But to launch an invasion, he needs an official declaration of war from his homeland, Carthage. Hannibal has given his Carthaginian leaders a major dilemma by antagonizing their aggressive neighbor. Now, Carthage's ruling council waits for Rome's ambassador. The Carthaginians hate Rome, but they fear its power. The Roman ambassador threatens war. The embassy was in a very bullish mood. They were quite willing to offer the Carthaginians war over this. They weren't going to keep negotiating. It was a simple thing. You either stop this, you either give us what we want, or we will fight you again. The Romans demand that Carthage hand Hannibal over. But Hannibal is out of their control. Carthage had created, without meaning to, this huge power in Spain led by Hannibal, who they didn't really know, who had some kind of mission and purpose in life that they didn't really understand. But this army was not in their payroll. They were not on the books. Should we make peace with Rome after Saguntum? Well, probably. Can we make peace with Rome? No. Oh, my goodness. Listen. The ambassador delivers an ultimatum. Hannibal or war? The Carthaginians look at him and say, you choose. Because to some extent, they don't believe what they say matters. They believe this is a charade. They think the Romans are determined on war and the Romans are going to push Carthage into war no matter what. The Mediterranean isn't big enough for both of them. And now it's official. This is war. In Spain, Hannibal has built his army, 46,000 strong. Now, he finishes his plan for the invasion of the Roman Republic. And he knows the route that will bring maximum terror. Rome. His plan is to defeat Rome. How am I going to do that? Well, I've got to take them by surprise. How do I do that? Across the gate, the door that they can't possibly expect, the Alps. The Alps are the highest mountain range in Europe but they are the back door to Italy. Crossing them with an army will be deadly, but for Hannibal, it will be worth it. We must imagine that he wants to cross the Alps because they're there, because nobody has ever done this before, because this alone will win him a place in the history books. Hannibal plans to take his battle elephants with him over the mountains, making his surprise attack more devastating, but the journey more difficult. It's worth speculating that one of the reasons that Hannibal was so insistent on taking elephants with him 
was that he could say to his men, look, if the elephants can do it, you can do it. And if we can bring these elephants to Italy, elephants of all things to take over the Alps of all places, then we can do anything. Unaware of Hannibal's ambitious plan, the Romans prepare to attack him with the full might of their war machine. The Senate chooses Scipio as their commander to send against Hannibal. Scipio believes vanquishing the young Carthaginian upstart will be easy. Rome can draw on massive manpower from its republic. Scipio directs. He will take his army to Spain and crush Hannibal before he can threaten Rome. Rome is going right from the beginning for a direct solution to the problem. We will win this war by the quickest, simplest route. We will go to the heart of the enemy's strength and we will beat them there and force them to give in. Now Hannibal has decided to do exactly the same thing. He's going to Italy and he's going to Rome with his army. But the Romans from their plans quite clearly had no inkling that this was what he was going to do. His men gather supplies of footwear and winter clothing. They need masses of provisions for the march. As Hannibal gets ready, his scouts report that hostile local tribes will try to block his invasion. Hannibal ignores the threat and forges ahead with his risky plan. I think if we had been able to sit down with Hannibal and said, Hannibal, it's a brilliant plan, but surely you recognize that it might not work. I think Hannibal's answer would have been, I'm a risk taker, and maybe it won't work, but maybe it will. And isn't it better to uh, have dared and failed than never to have dared at all? Hannibal leaves Spain in the spring of 218 BC. He and his massive army make rapid progress, fighting their way through the Pyrenees and across southern France. In just four months, they reach the Alps. Hannibal has never seen anything like it. Beyond these mountains lies the object of his lifelong obsession, Rome. Rome had humiliated his father, had humiliated Carthage, humiliated the Barker family. This was it. Hannibal was going to show him. Dwarfed by the highest mountain range in Europe, Hannibal enters the Alpine foothills in late October. It's a dangerous time to be crossing the Alps. Blizzards and avalanches can make the crossing impossible. But Hannibal is determined to surprise the Romans, and he won't wait until spring. Invading Italy unexpectedly across the Alps was what Hannibal was born to do. It was his destiny. It was a master stroke. But crossing the Alps will be no easy task. Hannibal's army, his elephants, even his legendary confidence will be put to the test in one of the most difficult marches to war in history. The 
higher Hannibal climbs into the mountains, the more treacherous the conditions become. No one has ever attempted to take an army with elephants across the Alps. Hannibal is an invader in a hostile and dangerous land. These people were going into the unknown. And so as it got colder, as the wind blasted them, as elephants, huge elephants, plummeted to their death in deaths into these ravines, as people got frostbite and their toes hurt and everything hurt and their bellies grumbled, morale must have been the greatest difficulty the army faced. Confusion reigns over which is the best route for Hannibal to take. On many occasions, the army has to retrace its steps. Hannibal hires tribes of Alpine Gauls to lead the way. Hannibal could never have crossed the Alps if he had not gotten intelligence from the Gauls of where the appropriate pass was. But Hannibal is successful with some of the Gauls getting them on his side and not successful with others. Some of the Alpine Gauls are hostile. Every invader is an enemy and an opportunity for plunder. For days, hostile Gauls strike Hannibal's lines, killing men and animals and stealing supplies. Hannibal fights skirmish after skirmish, urging his men to keep fighting. Despite heavy casualties, he moves on quickly. Nothing will stop his attack. In Rome, the Senate is still waiting for Scipio to reach Spain and destroy Hannibal. But events are not unfolding as they hoped. En route to Spain, Scipio learns that Hannibal's army has passed the other way, heading east towards Italy. Desperate for the glory of being the first to fight the Carthaginian, Scipio ignores the Senate's orders and races home. If Hannibal makes it into Italy, Scipio will be waiting. Hannibal continues his march. In just nine days, Hannibal reaches the highest pass. He has marched his army up over 8,000 feet. But fighting the Gauls in the mountains has taken a terrible toll. His men are starving, exhausted, and demoralized. In the distance, Hannibal can see Italy. He tries to raise his army's spirits by reminding them of the riches and glory waiting for them in Rome. Hannibal takes his men to a place where there's actually a view. He then says, there it is. This is what we've come for. This is the promised land. We just need to go down now and take what we have earned. But that night, the first heavy snows start to fall. most monumental blizzard they have known hits them. They go to sleep shivering if they can, they're so cold. They wake up covered with snow, ice in their beards. Every breath is a pain, it's so cold. Their lungs are seared. Uh, many of them, if not most of them, have frostbite. 
Hannibal has spent years creating an army to take on Rome. And now, his men are freezing to death before his eyes. It is only his strength of character that keeps them going. By the time he'd come this far, there was no point turning back. It was further home than it was to his objective of Italy. And it's probably the greatest trial he faces before he actually meets the Roman army in battle, is just to keep that army moving, to make sure that people don't give in. As conditions get worse, more and more men succumb to the cold. Hannibal shares his army's fears and their hardships. Their aim is to attack Rome, but first, they must stay alive. I think Hannibal's looking at a 24-hour time span. He'll promise his men anything, he'll tell his men anything, but just get down from the Alps with everyone you've got left. Draggled, hungry, and depleted, Hannibal's army finally arrives in northern Italy. Hannibal's achievement in getting his army across the Alps proves his great leadership and determination. That he brought elephants with him launches him into legend. Imagine those first Roman scouts. Their eyes bulge. They see elephants. They see the strange army. And they say to their commanders who pass the message on, excuse me, sir, there appear to be elephants north of us. And the commander says, are you drunk? This is impossible. Forty-six thousand of Hannibal's men entered the Alps. Now, only twenty-six thousand remain. But these warriors are tough and battle-hardened. The army he took into Italy, they may have been tired, they may have been exhausted, they may have been frostbitten, but they were damn good. They'd survived a thousand-mile trek. They'd, they'd fought tribes so many times getting to Italy. They'd crossed the highest mountains in Europe. If ever there was an army worthy and capable of taking Rome, this was it. But Hannibal's army has been cut nearly in half. War on Roman soil is imminent. But the outcome of such a bold and daring invasion 
is yet to be seen. Hannibal is finally in Italy and eager to fight his first Romans. He doesn't have to wait long. Just weeks after arriving in northern Italy, Hannibal stumbles across a contingent of Roman cavalry near the river Tachinus. The Romans are led by Scipio. He has made it back to Italy in time to be the first to fight Hannibal. If Scipio can meet and beat Hannibal now, then Scipio is going to get the glory for it. So he wants a quick victory. He is not afraid of the Carthaginians. Hannibal is also confident. He knows and trusts this army that he's been fighting with for such a long time. Hannibal's men are trained in mobile warfare. They run circles around the clumsy Romans. Badly wounded, Scipio doesn't win glory fighting Hannibal. But one day, his son, Scipio the Younger, will face the same adversary. I think young Scipio would have looked back at the Battle of Tachinus as a wake-up call. It was also a first chance for him to get a taste of Hannibal's tactics. This is his first taste of the legend. Hannibal celebrates his first victory on Roman soil with his brother, Mago. Uh, initially, he allows the psychological effect to resonate Hannibal is here. Hannibal has crossed the Alps. And everyone fears him. Rome's reaction is one of panic. Hannibal soon learns that Rome is moving thousands of men northward to stop him. Rome can call on over a quarter of a million troops from its allies in the Republic. Hannibal has just 26,000 men. His army is now much smaller than it had been when it started out. So he needs extra troops. He can't afford to take on Roman armies where he's so severely outnumbered. Hannibal plans to use his victories to win over Rome's allies. His victory over Scipio has an instant effect. In Scipio's camp, local Gauls slit the throats of Roman soldiers. They hate Rome for conquering their homeland in northern Italy. After Tachinus, they decide to escape from their Roman overlords and join Hannibal's army. In Hannibal, they see a man capable of taking on the Romans and winning. Hannibal has been in Italy less than a month, and the Roman Republic is already fracturing. The north, made up of small city-states, is now his. Bolstered by his new allies, Hannibal marches south, destroying Roman legions and terrorizing those states that stay loyal to Rome. If Hannibal can break the Roman alliance, Rome will lose its manpower and fall. The Romans will do anything to stop him. They throw more and more troops at Hannibal. They feel so confident, they carry shackles to imprison him, should they take him alive. They have no idea what they're up against. The Carthaginians know how to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. The Romans only know how to punch, and they keep on punching over and over and over again, thinking somehow this time they're going to strike a knockout blow. In spite of all the evidence to the contrary, they just keep on doing the wrong thing. 
But it's not all good news for Hannibal. His battle elephants are dying, and they've hardly been used. The elephants are probably the most overrated part of Hannibal's army. Um, we always talk about them, and what people tend to forget is they died. Hannibal brings them all the way from Spain, through southern France, over the Alps, and then they all die. But Hannibal doesn't need elephants against the lumbering Roman legions. Hannibal outwits an entire army at Lake Trasimene in central Italy, trapping and slaughtering 30,000 Romans. The pressure on Rome is beginning to build up. Tens of thousands of Romans and Italians have died since Hannibal arrived. And he's proven to them that he can do things with his army that they can't dream of. But he probably knows that he needs something bigger. He will have to deliver a knockout blow. Soon, the Romans will give Hannibal the opportunity he so desperately needs. Sumus. Despite repeated defeats, the Romans pretend not to feel the pain Hannibal inflicts. Roma! 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 Instead, the Senate decides to call up the largest army in Rome's history to try to put an end to Hannibal once and for all. Tens of thousands of Roman troops have fought Hannibal since he crossed the Alps, and no one has come close to beating him. Now, the largest army the Roman Republic would ever assemble stands poised to take on the Carthaginian. The young Scipio has already faced Hannibal's sophisticated war machine and survived. Now, he prepares to face him again in what will be one of the greatest battles of all time. The Battle of Cannae. The Romans watched in amazement as Hannibal attempted to isolate Rome from its allies. Now in the summer of 216 BC, Hannibal seizes a vital Roman supply store at Cannae and blocks the route to the grain fields in the south. Goaded and threatened by hunger, the Romans march out to crush him. Hannibal must have known that this was it. This was Rome's big attempt to exterminate him. And they thought they could do it, as they always had done, by sheer weight of numbers. continue to gather at Cannae until 85,000 men face the Carthaginians. The night before the battle, Hannibal's camp is tense. His men are anxious to hear how Hannibal imagines winning against such a huge army. In his tent, Hannibal formulates his plan. Hannibal could feel confident on the eve of the Battle of Cannae that in spite of Roman superiority in numbers, Carthaginian tactical superiority uh, could yet win the day. Hannibal calls his officers to his tent. Having fought and beaten enough Roman generals, he's able to guess what they'll do at Cannae. 
Hannibal is counting on the Romans to make a simple frontal attack, to go ahead without thinking about the danger that they have of exposing their flanks. The Romans rely on the brute force of their legions, legions that are virtually unstoppable once on the move. Hannibal will use that momentum to entice the Romans into a trap. Hannibal thought, I will allow them to push us back and push us back and push us back, and I'm going to be there, so I'm going to control this, this very, very measured retreat. And then we're going to keep going back, and then my wings are simply going to spread, and we've got the Roman army encircled. If the plan works, Canny will be Hannibal's masterpiece. Hannibal thought, I'm going to win because I'm better and I'm brighter, and that is going to finish Rome. And after Canny, they will come to me and treat for peace on my terms. The next morning, the Roman army marches onto the battlefield. Neither Hannibal, his men, nor any of the Romans have ever seen so many soldiers in one place. The Romans form a huge, deep block, stretching back for almost a mile. Hannibal can see that this army is big and it's going to go forward and deliver a very strong attack, but it isn't going to be able to do anything very clever at all. It isn't maneuverable. It's a big, clumsy sledgehammer of a force. Among the men is Scipio the Younger, now an officer. But at Cannae, he still has much to learn. For millennia to come, generals will study the inspired positioning of Hannibal's troops. In front of the massed Roman infantry, Hannibal places his allies from Spain and Gaul. They will bear the brunt of Rome's attack. Cavalry face each other on both flanks. Elite African mercenaries are held in reserve. Hannibal puts himself in the front line with his Spaniards and Gauls. Here, he will be exposed to great personal peril. Hannibal is par excellence, the leader by example. Here is a Barker. Here is Hamilcar's heir. Does he sit on a white or a black horse on a bluff, looking down on his army fighting at Cannae? No. Hannibal is there in the center of his center, fighting at huge risk clearly to himself, like the most common of his private soldiers. Facing the full force of Rome's greatest army, Hannibal leads his men forward to meet them. He advances the center of his infantry line to provoke the Romans, to lure them on, to make sure that that Roman infantry attack comes straight in where he wants it. That's where he is himself, and that's where Mago, his brother, is. They stick with the Gauls and Spaniards. Gauls and Spaniards fight to keep formation. Their instinct should be to flee, and yet Hannibal stands there with them, steadying them, stiffening their resolve, ensuring that they don't flee. Instead, they backpedal very slowly, sucking the Romans into a trap. The Romans surge forward. As far 
as the Romans are concerned, their plan is working perfectly. There's a chance of this massive, clumsy victory that they'd wanted, so they push on. But in doing this, they've lost what little order they had. It's like the crowd spilling out of a big football match. Thousands and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, crammed together in a very small space. The Romans are playing straight into Hannibal's hands. His plan is working. While Hannibal, the Gauls, and Spaniards keep the Roman infantry occupied, his cavalry rout the Roman horsemen and chase them from the field. Hannibal springs his trap. His deadly African mercenaries cut into the undefended Roman flanks. They're suddenly facing foes that are coming from different directions. They can't organize a proper fighting line to face them. Everything is chaos. Momentum from the Roman attack goes completely. The crowd has stopped, but most men in it don't know what's happening at all. Hannibal's cavalry returns to complete the encirclement of the Roman infantry. The Romans are surrounded, but the battle doesn't stop there. Those tens of thousands of Romans have to be killed, and they have to be killed by hand. It's a case of a long, steady, prolonged slaughter, fought very brutally, face to face, toe to toe, eye to eye. The young Scipio manages to fight his way out. 50,000 of his comrades do not. Hannibal and his men spend the entire day annihilating the Romans in one of the greatest battles in history. But the fierce war between the two rival civilizations is far from over. Cannae is a bloodbath of epic proportions. This is Rome's worst defeat and Hannibal's greatest victory. He hasn't ambushed them. He hasn't surprised them. He hasn't used elephants or anything dirty and exotic like that against them. He has gone with a smaller army and he's simply beaten them. But he hasn't just beaten them because he has virtually destroyed this army that was bigger than anything the Romans had ever put into the field. Hannibal collects the rings of dead aristocrats from among the 50,000 mutilated Roman corpses. He had slaughtered Romans beyond his wildest dreams, and he had won glory enough to satisfy any human for a lifetime. But he was a pro. I'd be surprised if he thought that after Cannae, that was it, that the war was over. So naturally, he would have paused for a moment to say, wow. After Cannae, it seems just a matter of time before Hannibal's dream of crushing the Roman Republic and saving his homeland of Carthage will come true. In Rome, the effect of the carnage will be felt for decades. Hannibal's army has killed 50,000 Romans. The male lines of countless families are wiped out. Everyone fears the name Hannibal. After Cannae, the Romans are very scared of Hannibal. After Cannae, Romans can imagine their city being destroyed, defeated, and the Republic ending. In Rome, they wait for Hannibal to attack their city. But Hannibal's army is relatively small, designed for winning quick victories on the battlefield, not for long sieges. The 
problem was manpower. You cannot besiege a city unless you outnumber it significantly, at least three to one. That's the usual rule of thumb. Hannibal needs more men. Mago. Hannibal sends his brother Mago to Carthage to demand reinforcements. With him, he sends the rings taken from the dead at Cannae as proof of his power. At the same time, he sends an envoy to the Roman Senate to press them to surrender and end the slaughter. But the Romans refused to negotiate. They expel his envoy from the city without even meeting him. For Rome, there is too much at stake. If they made peace with the Carthaginians, their entire confederacy would fall apart. They, that has to be what they thought was at stake. The Roman Republic derived its power and military might from its allied city-states. After the slaughter at Cannae, many of these allies in the south defect to Hannibal. If Rome shows any weakness now, more will abandon the Republic. As Hannibal waits for more allies to join him, he also eagerly expects reinforcements from Carthage. Hannibal expects Carthage to scent the opportunity that he can see, that Rome is in a bad way. It won't take too much more. If we keep on pushing, Rome will crumble, Rome will fall. So Hannibal expects Carthage to back him up to the hilt. Hannibal's brother arrives in Carthage to request reinforcements. With a direct message from the battlefield at Cannae. The rings taken from thousands of slain Roman aristocrats. Mago tells the council that Hannibal is on the verge of victory and needs reinforcements. But the council is afraid of what will happen to Carthage if Hannibal loses. We almost get a sense of a see no evil, hear no evil government. They're willing to give Hannibal enough rope to go out and fight Rome but they seem to want to have plausible deniability. Gosh, we don't know anything about this war. You know, that's, that's this crazy renegade general going out and doing that. What do we have to do with that? And by the same token, their attitude towards Hannibal seems to be, if you can do it on the cheap, that's fine. But we've got other fish to fry. It's your baby and it's your problem. Frustrated by the council's lack of support, Mago leaves Carthage. Hannibal will continue the war with Rome alone. His army rampages through Roman towns and villages to provoke Rome to war. Hannibal wants to goad them into another battle like Cannae, but victory against the Roman Republic is far from certain. In the hills near the blood-soaked fields of Cannae, a hard, new Roman state of mind is emerging, epitomized by Scipio. Stunned survivors of Cannae believe that Hannibal is unbeatable and talk of fleeing. Scipio demands they stay strong. Scipio convinces him to keep going. 
He convinces them that Rome is something to be fought for and that they should never surrender. This kind of bloody-minded, stubborn refusal to admit defeat. The Romans simply don't accept that they're beaten. This state of mind will fuel Rome's determination to survive. There is no other state in the ancient world that could have endured those defeats and kept on fighting. Anyone else would have given in at this point. The Romans will not consider that. It is not an option as far as they're concerned. They either win or they are destroyed, and Rome, the Republic, ceases to be. The Senate tears up the Roman rule book. Traditionally, commanders had to be in their 40s, but now Scipio, still in his 20s, is given command. After years of watching Hannibal on the battlefield, Scipio will help Rome rise from the dead. First, Rome rebuilds its armies. The old rules on who could join the army are relaxed. Boys are enlisted into the legions. Slaves are promised freedom if they sign up. Criminals and debtors are promised amnesty. The war tax is increased. It's the time when they were pushed to the very brink of extinction. And yet, they stand there, they're not bowed. It's not just the aristocratic leaders who want to keep on fighting. Roman citizens are willing to keep serving in the army. They'll keep on fighting. They feel it is their duty to the state. They feel they have a stake in what's happening and that the fate of the Republic is something that is worth fighting and dying for. Most of Rome's allies stay loyal. They flock to join the legions, preferring the stability of the Roman Republic to Hannibal. Rome offered all its peoples the rule of law. Rome protected its peoples. Hannibal, however, wasn't even offering anything that tangible. He had come to set people free. Of what? Well, uh, he might hesitate. Tyranny, the Roman tyranny. They defeated my father. They want to crush Carthage. Well, frankly, I'm not terribly sure where Carthage is. It's some way from here. And, you know, can I just get on with my life, please? As long as their allies stay loyal, Rome has the largest manpower reserves in the known world. But no matter how many fields Hannibal's men torch or how many towns they pillage, the Romans will not be drawn into another Kenny. He would have liked nothing better than for the Romans to come out and fight him in another battle, to have a second Cani. But they've learned from their mistakes. They're not going to do him that favor. And we might well imagine him frustrated by the Romans' steadfast refusal to fight. The Romans form a new plan to evict Hannibal. First, Scipio will destroy Hannibal's power base in Spain. Then, he'll invade Carthage itself. Hannibal will be forced to return to Africa. In Spain, Scipio will try to transform the lumbering Roman legions to prove he is a great general. Scipio is a peculiar combination of enmity towards Hannibal, obsession with Hannibal, and admiration for Hannibal. He seems to understand very early on that the only way to beat Hannibal is to play Hannibal's game, to fight like Hannibal. 
If Scipio succeeds in Spain, it will mark a giant leap forward for Rome. It was only in the struggle to defeat Hannibal that Rome developed those strengths that allowed her to grow into world dominion. And Hannibal was the cause of all that. So in attempting to destroy Rome, paradoxically, he gave it birth. While Scipio is in Spain, Roman legions in Italy take back city after city from Hannibal. Four years after Cannae, Rome's scouts report a terrifying sight. Hannibal is still determined to bring about Rome's downfall. To stop the Romans from attacking his allies, he will march on the city itself. at the gates of Rome. Rome is the epicenter of Hannibal's loathing, the heart of the republic that threatens to destroy Carthage. The Roman reaction to Hannibal finally marching on their city is not what he expects. And this time, they are ready. Even if Hannibal could take Rome, he can't keep it. Now, Hannibal learns that fresh legions are marching to meet him. He will have to retreat from the city. The Roman system is too strong. He realizes Rome is far more than a city. Rome is a state of mind. And so, in attacking Rome physically, he's wasting, he knows, his and other people's time and effort. Because even if you exterminated Rome, in a critical sense to Hannibal, Rome would continue as a state of mind. Hannibal continues his fight for nine long years. Then, a delegation from Carthage arrives at Hannibal's camp with devastating news. Scipio has conquered Spain and has now invaded Carthage. The delegation insists that Hannibal return home. Hannibal could say, no, Carthage, you're on your own. You've left me on my own. You haven't helped me. You are on your own. Sort yourselves out. I'm going to Crete. I'm going into retirement to live off the pension you don't send me. Did he know he went back? Why? Because this game wasn't over and he had to just see it out. Hannibal leaves Italy and returns to North Africa in 202 BC. For the first time since he was nine years old, Hannibal sets foot on African soil. Carthage is still his home. It must have been extraordinary for Hannibal to return to Africa for the first time since he was nine years old. After having had another life in Spain and another life in Italy, no doubt there was something of a letdown to go back to Africa and something of a shock uh, to go back to Africa, a land he hardly knew. But Hannibal being Hannibal, he set himself to the task at hand to defeat the Romans in battle. Hannibal doesn't return to the city of Carthage directly. In the surrounding countryside, he sees the devastation wrought by Scipio's new Roman army. Towns and villages are in ruin. Fearing the Romans will destroy the city itself, 
the Carthaginian council is on the brink of surrendering to Scipio. But with the return of Hannibal, they change their minds. They want Hannibal to fight, but his army is vastly reduced. The council underestimates the fight against the Romans. He sees these people who vacillated throughout the war now changing their mind, being on the brink of despair at one point, then suddenly being buoyed up with confidence that he must realize is not entirely well placed because he doesn't have the same resources he used to. His army is a shadow of what it used to be. So Hannibal is not impressed with the Carthaginian government. Hannibal knows his army isn't ready to take on Scipio. But his loyalty still lies with Carthage. For the first time in his career, Hannibal will be fighting on someone else's terms. Ultimately, Hannibal's honor was going to rise or fall on his ability to do damage to Rome. And so he really has no choice uh, but to continue the war and to support the very government that had not supported him. Uh, it's the only game in town, and so he's going to have to play it whether he likes it or not. Hannibal will fight the Romans on the plains of Zama. He will have a fresh supply of battle elephants. But this time, he'll be facing a new kind of Roman army, led by Scipio. The day before the battle, the two greatest generals of their time meet. I think Hannibal is intrigued. He's interested. He cannot resist the opportunity to meet Scipio, who is both his nemesis and, in a sense, his pupil. If Scipio has learned even half of what Hannibal knows, Carthage and Hannibal's legend are in trouble. Perhaps he thought that he could gain intelligence on what Scipio was doing and what Scipio had planned. Perhaps he thought that he could psych out Scipio, frighten Scipio by doing a number on him. But the other thing that's remarkable about it is that it looks as if Scipio was playing Hannibal. Scipio is playing for time. While Scipio talks, reinforcements arrive in his camp. The idea that Scipio tricks Hannibal of all people, tricking the trickster, that's, that's quite remarkable. At Zama, Hannibal witnesses how sophisticated the Roman army has become. Scipio has mastered Hannibal's art of war. He even renders Hannibal's battle elephants obsolete. When the elephants charge, Scipio orders his men to split into lanes, so they thunder harmlessly by. Hannibal's few remaining veterans, so deadly at Cannae, are now surrounded and slaughtered. At Zama, Scipio beat Hannibal at his own game. And I think that must have been a very bitter moment for Hannibal. The Romans are out Hannibaling Hannibal. Scipio is the only man to ever defeat Hannibal. His victory earns him the title Africanus. Zama is the beginning of the end for Carthage. In time, the Romans will add North Africa to their growing empire. But 
But Hannibal's war with Rome is far from over. In the coming decades, it will become even more personal. And Hannibal will never betray his lifelong oath. For the first time in 36 years, Hannibal returns to Carthage. His battle with Rome will never end, but without an army, Carthage's only hope is to accept Scipio's peace terms and live to fight another day. <laughs> In the council chamber, Hannibal comes face to face with the politicians who made his war with Rome so difficult. Now, they want to reject Scipio's terms. After the Battle of Zama, we could forgive Hannibal asking himself who's worse, the Carthaginians or the Romans. I think he knew that the Carthaginian home government was hopeless it would never have given him the kind of support that the Roman home government gave their generals. And yet, as a Carthaginian, he simply had to play the game with the hand he was dealt, and that's the hand he was dealt. Despite his frustration with Carthage, Hannibal will continue to fight the spread of Rome. At the age of nine, he swore to fight the Romans forever. And he will never abandon his oath. I think Hannibal does care about Carthage, but he doesn't really know it very well. And it's quite probable that all the way through, he'd been fighting for an ideal Carthage, an illusion, a fantasy that just existed in his head, that was a creation of the stories his father had told him, the things he'd read, all that he'd learned whilst he was growing up in Spain, not seeing this place. So he'd fought and he struggled and he was beaten for an illusion. Hannibal's disillusionment is soon followed by a great betrayal. He's given his whole life for Carthage. He's destroyed Carthage's greatest enemies in the field several times. He's come home to protect Carthage. And what gratitude does he get for it? He gets betrayed by his own people. His own people are willing to hand him over to the Romans. The Carthaginians are only too happy to say, this was Hannibal's war. He's the bad guy. We had nothing to do with it. Hey, we didn't know anything about this war. And I think Hannibal might well have been philosophic about it and moved on. Betrayed by his homeland, Hannibal flees Africa. But determined to continue his fight against Rome, Hannibal travels east, selling his skills as a general to kingdoms still resisting Roman imperialism. For 13 years, he aids anyone who hates Rome. Roman rage for Hannibal still burns white hot. The memory of what Hannibal did to them at Cannae is an open wound. You have a whole generation of children now growing up whose fathers were killed at Cannae by Hannibal. Not the odd father, every father in the Senate, various people start to talk about the outrage that this man is still alive and still free. And so they start to hunt him down. The Romans send assassins to find Hannibal.
he is a hunted man. He has no home anymore. Spain, the place where he'd grown up, the province that his family had created, is now a Roman province. Carthage has gone. He can't go back there. The people there, the aristocracy, hate him and had chased him out. So he has no home. As far as we know, he had no family by this point. If the Romans capture Hannibal, he faces shame and humiliation. Eventually, assassins track him down in the remote Turkish town of Bithynia. Hannibal prepares to make his last stand. He will never give Rome the satisfaction of taking him alive. In one final gesture of defiance, Hannibal takes poison and ends his own life. His real courage in the end is to kill himself rather than be killed by Rome. Fifty years after Hannibal's death, Scipio's grandson returns to Carthage. His Roman army burns Carthage to the ground. wiping Rome's greatest rival from the map forever. What still terrified them was the specter of Hannibal. And in the end, that was why they destroyed Carthage. They didn't usually destroy competing civilizations. They usually absorbed them, and they were very good at that. But Carthage had scared them too much. And Carthage had scared them mainly in the person of Hannibal. Hannibal was the man who dared to provoke Rome to war. He was the man who did the impossible and took his army and his elephants across the Alps. He was the man with an extraordinary gift for battle who proved his military genius at Cannae. He was the man who came closer than anyone to defeating the Roman Republic. But in the end, he couldn't stop it from becoming an empire. It's the sheer audacity and unthinkableness of it. It's the nearness that he came. It's the poignancy between what he wanted to do and what he achieved. It's all of that that makes Hannibal so fascinating to us. Hannibal's incredible odyssey was over. But his impact would be felt throughout the world for thousands of years to come. Geographic Channel.